Hi everybody, this is the lecture for chapter 3, which covers the structure and function of cells, specifically what's going on inside of cells. So let's get started. Okay, so I'm going to grab my pen here. So the first slide covers the diversity of cells. So yes, cells all have lots of things in common with each other, so a membrane, um, cytoskeletal elements, those kinds of things. Uh, but among cells and life itself, because life and cells are interchangeable, um, to some regard, there's lots and lots and lots of cell diversity. So here we have three examples of not only different cell types and different tissues, but also different uh, microscopy techniques. So over here in A, we've got nasal sinus cells. So this is a, a section of human nasal cavity tissue. And in B, we have onion cells. So these are both light microscope images, um, but this one has a stain called an H&E stain, which is why it looks pink and purple, because hematoxylin and ESN give you that pink and purple color. And then the onion cells are blue because they have been stained with a different compound, and that's methylene blue. So not only can cells look different due to their shape and structure under a microscope, but you can also choose different stains for them. So not all stains are created equal, and some of them result in different colors than others. Over here at C, we have different um, cells interacting with each other. In this particular case, we've got Vibrio tasmaniensis, a bacterial cells. Uh, Vibrio is a illness that you can contract from eating undercooked or poorly prepared seafood, uh, specifically shellfish um, like oysters, but most people don't get it. It's not usually a big deal as long as the oysters are prepared properly. So you might notice in the H&E stain and the methylene blue stain, these are both light microscopy. So the pictures that result from those are called light micrographs. This one is scanning electron microscopy, um, which is a different way to get images, and you can resolve much smaller images as well. So the scale here and the scale bar shows you 10 microns. So if I know that this much is 10 microns, let me erase one of those. If, so if this is 10 microns and I apply the same logic, I can be like, well, this cell here is probably uh, almost 10, I would say about 9.5 microns across, perhaps. Um, so in lab, when you were asked to estimate the size of things based on field diameter, uh, I'm doing something similar here, but I'm estimating size of cells based on the scale bar. Uh, so over here, you'll notice that these two are in microns, which is a thousandth of a millimeter, and this is in nanometers, which is a thousandth of that. So this is really, really small, and that's one of the powerful things about scanning electron microscopy is that you can resolve really, really, really tiny stuff. So these are not actually yellow on a blue background. These are falsely colored so that you can make out the distinction between the Vibrio cells and the background. So all SEM photomicrographs are by definition uh, black and white, but scientists will often color them in so you can make out the distinction between structures. Okay, so let's trash all that. Here we have some light microscopes. So these are the kinds that you've been using. Um, they look a little bit different than the ones that you've been using in lab, but they have all the same parts. So A is a light microscope, and this is one where the light comes up from the bottom, and it shines through a transparent specimen on a slide, which is usually under a piece of cover glass like that. So light trans shines through. Let's make our little specimen in here. And then you use the objective lens to look at it. So that's how compound light microscopes work. This is a dissecting microscope over here. We have a platform with stage clips and then a objective lens that is not switchable. Instead, when you turn this knob, the entire apparatus goes up or down, so closer to or further away from the specimen. And this is 
a lower magnification power microscope, and those are used to examine larger objects such as tissues. That's why it's called dissecting microscope because these are often used to dissect small things. Come on, there we go. Okay, so cell theory. I want you to remember from chapter one that a theory is a fact or set of facts about the world that are commonly held to be true because they are supported by the validation of many, many hypotheses. So these are not the same as hypotheses because a hypothesis is of course an educated guess or your best estimation of what is true based on available facts. A theory is the outcome of hypothesis testing and not just once but many, many times over. So we can be really confident that theories are true. However, we don't want to use the word proven for these. That's a word that we avoid in science because every new advance in technology that allows us to examine our world more closely um, comes with some new and unexpected discoveries. So we never say that stuff is proven, we only say that uh, it is supported hypothetically and that it is a theory, if true. So cell theory in particular uh, holds the following to be true. One, all life, life forms are composed of at least one or more cells. So another way to say this is if it's not a cell, it isn't alive. Cells are the basic unit of life, so this is a corollary to this first one. And all cells come from previous cells, so you cannot spontaneously create or destroy cells from nothing. So cannot wink into or out of existence. And these three principles still stand today. So cell theory was codified in the early 1800s, about 200 years after uh, cells were first observed by a microscope in the mid 1600s. So we as humans have been observing cells for a really long time. It just took a while for enough observations to accumulate to call it a theory. So that goes back to our idea that theories are the result of much hypothesis testing over long periods of time typically. Okay, so just to remind you, all cells fall into two types. We've talked about the domains of life before. So eukaryotes are cells with a nucleus and organelles. Prokaryotes lack a nucleus and instead have an area of DNA called a nucleoid. And they are very small and simple compared with eukaryotes. So we'll go more into this in a little bit. Um, and we'll even look at the difference between, say, animal and plant cells within the eukaryotes. And remember, prokarya includes bacteria and archaea. And archaea are bacteria-like microorganisms, but they tend to prefer really extreme environments. And they are genetically distinct from a phylogenetic perspective. So that's why they are separate. Okay, so if we're emphasizing differences, it would also be wise to emphasize similarities. And so we need to address the structures that are found in all cells, regardless of whether they are prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So I mentioned a couple things, and one of those is a cell membrane. So you have to have a membrane that separates you from your surroundings if you want to be a cell that's distinct from your environment. They all have cytoplasm, which is the stuff inside the membrane. They all have ribosomes because these are the factories where protein is made. And protein synthesis is critical to cell survival. Nothing in a cell gets done without proteins ever. And you have one or more chromosomes. This is the genetic material, DNA, and this contains instructions for how to make proteins. So. Instructions for 
protein synthesis. So all cells have these. This is the bare minimum requirement that you must have in order to be considered a cell. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at some prokaryotes. And this is just sort of a basic garden variety prokaryote. Um, this one has basically all the possible features of prokaryotic cells, um, not because all prokaryotes look like this, but rather because we needed a picture to show you to show you all this stuff. So I'm going to walk you through each bit. Inside of the cell, there is a watery mixture of ions and proteins and other compounds called the cytoplasm. And remember, this is one of those features that all cells have, regardless of whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Additionally, there are numerous ribosomes. And note that these ribosomes are just kind of floating around in the cytoplasm. They're not attached to anything. Uh, that's a major distinction from eukaryotes, which we'll see a little bit later. The DNA is localized in a region called a nucleoid. Nucleoid means nucleus-like, which implies that it is like a nucleus, but it is not a true nucleus. Why? Well, it's not contained within a membrane, which is the makings of a proper nucleus. What else do we got here? Okay, so in addition to the membrane itself, which is illustrated here in green, there's also a cell wall, and this is typically made with some sort of structurally reinforced material. Um, it depends species to species what exactly that is, but it's an additional layer outside of the membrane. And a capsule on the outside, so this is the cell's glycocalyx, which we'll go more into later. Now notice, so we've got a membrane, and a cell wall and a capsule. It's a lot of layers of protection, and that makes sense because this is a tiny cell that's pretty vulnerable, so it needs some extra defenses since it's all on its own. It's not uh, in a tissue or in an organism, it's just by itself. So the pili are extensions of the cell membrane and cytoplasm that poke through all of those defensive layers and they allow uh, the cell to exchange materials with its environment. And then finally, we have a flagellum, which is a tail, and this permits the organism to swim. All right, moving on to eukaryotic cells. Uh, if this were microbiology, we'd go much more into detail about the diversity of prokaryotes because they are extremely diverse as a group. But we just don't have the time for this, that in Biology 160, so we're going to sort of do a cursory examination of prokarya and move on to eukaryotes because this class is a feeder class for A and P, and therefore eukaryotic cells are kind of the ones that we care most about. Sorry, prokaryotes. So there are five principal components to a eukaryotic cell. The nucleus, which is where DNA is. Other organelles, which are typically membrane enclosed and have myriad functions that we'll discuss. The cytosol, which is the substance between the membrane and the organelles, specifically the nucleus. The cytoskeleton, which we'll talk about later, so this is literally a microscopic skeleton that provides the cell with structural integrity. And finally, the membrane, which all cells have, so keeps cell separate from environment. And controls what can enter and leave, which is really important for cell health. Oops, enter, there we go, I can spell, I promise, or leave. 
Et voila. So in the next few slides, we will just go through each of these in turn and describe the appearance, location, and function of each of these components. All right, so eukaryotic cells have many components. We just discussed some of them, so I'm going to use my pen and just go through them. So the nucleus is usually the largest organelle, and it is a membrane-enclosed ball um, with a denser region in the center of it. The other organelles are primarily made of membranes that are folded into particular con uh, configurations, so you can see that here. It's a bunch of membranes inside of a big membrane. The cytosol is all of the material that is between all those membranes. So you can see this blue stuff. And the cytoskeleton is going to function to anchor organelles in their place, give the cell the shape that it has overall, and just provide structural support in general. The plasma membrane is what keeps the cell separate from its environment. So it's all of that stuff. Okay, so let's ask ourselves a question now, and that would be, where would you expect to find a cytoskeleton? So let's break down this word first, cyto, oops, I need this, cell, skeleton, bones. And I'm putting this in air quotes because, of course, they're not osseous tissue, they're not actually bones. So inside the nucleus, no. Why? Well, we know that that's where DNA is in there. As the internal structure of a mitochondrion, even if you're not 100% certain about this, um, let's say you're taking the test and you're not sure, just put a dot by it and come back. Read the rest, and if you find a better option, pick that one. Between bacterial cells, no, that's out because that's stuff that's outside of a cell. Throughout the cytosol, that's a good candidate. So I might put a star next to this one and as the outer coat on an insect. So here is why this is not an answer. We haven't even talked about insects in this class. So anytime you see an answer where there's a word in the choice that I have never spoken about or addressed, that's a pretty good indication that it is a red herring and therefore easily go away. Now you get to see my Spotify account. Congratulations. Okay, and sorry about that. Um, Anyway, if I never mention something in class and you see it in an answer choice, it's pretty clear that it's a fake answer. Okay, so here we have a eukaryotic cell, and this is specifically an animal cell. I know because I don't see a cell wall around it or any chloroplast. So we'll get to plant cells probably in the next presentation after this. For this particular video, I'm just going to record about... Uh, animal cells only, and then I'm going to stop and I'll make another recording starting with plant cells and going to the end because it just, um, the file size of the videos gets too much to upload if I talk for too long and don't break it up into parts. That's the deal here. Okay, so organelles. Um, organelles means tiny organ. And so these are primarily membrane enclosed, and these provide the metabolic and catalytic activity of the cell that helps keep the cell alive. So specifically, any membrane enclosed structure that is involved in protein production is considered to be an organelle, and this can be either directly or indirectly. So the information for the construction of proteins is contained in the DNA in the nucleus. So you can think of the cell nucleus as being the control center of the cell. All right, so let's look. So what we're looking at here is a uh, blown up section of a cell that spans the nucleus and the neighboring organelles. So Nucleus is here, so that means this is the nucleus, and inside the nucleus we have the DNA molecule. So if you want to make a protein, what you must do, and we'll talk more about this uh, later, is use some enzymes to make a transcript 
of the blueprint. So you don't actually snip the blueprint out and take it elsewhere. You make a little copy of it and then you send the copy outside of the nucleus. And this comes in the form of mRNA, M standing for messenger. And that's because it's providing the information and taking the information outside of the nucleus. So it is messenger in that it takes a message to another location in the cell. So ribosomes, which all cells have, either free ribosomes or fixed ones. So free ribosomes just float around in the cytoplasm. Fixed ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so if a protein needs to be made that's going to stay in the cell, specifically in the cytoplasm, it's going to be made by a free ribosome. So these guys make proteins for inside the cell. <coughs> if a protein is going to be made by a fixed ribosome, these typically need to be in the cell membrane. So stuck into the membrane near the edge of the cell, or they're going to be exocytosed outside the cell altogether. So that's what's happening here. So here you can see one of these ribosomes. So I'm going to redirect this arrow is clamping onto this mRNA transcript, and then it's kind of pooping out a little protein right here. So this particular protein is destined for outside the cell, so it's going to be made by a fixed ribosome. And the protein is going to be extruded or assembled into the intermembrane space inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. So notice that right now it's a polypeptide chain, and then as it travels within the environment of the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to fold up. So it attains its, its uh, excuse me, final, I was trying to combine the words final and quaternary, that didn't work, its final and quaternary structure uh, by the time it is ready to exit the endoplasmic reticulum. Then it gets transported via vesicle, which is a bubble of membrane, and that vesicle travels through the Golgi apparatus why does it do that? Well, the Golgi apparatus or Golgi complex, those words are interchangeable. Its job is to sort and package things for transport either within or out of the cell. So it will sort like things together into vesicles and then transport those vesicles to where they need to go. So in this case, it looks like this protein was destined for outside of the cell. So the vesicle fused with the external membrane of the cell and out comes the protein. So here's another view of the nucleus and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and here you can see that the membranes of the nuclear envelope, which is the mem double membrane system that encloses the nucleus, and the endoplasmic reticulum, these are actually the same continuous membrane. <laughs> Meaning there's no distinct stop between one and the other. Um, and that's because of the close relationship between the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum. So if all of the protein instructions live in here and the protein factories are all out here, then it makes sense for these two organelles to stay close to each other. And by the way, when I talk about membranes and organelles, they're uh, built the exact same way that the cell membrane is built. So they're phospholipid bilayers just like the outer cell membrane. There's no difference in macromolecular structure between the two. Okay, so here you can see the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus, I need a smaller dot here, I think. So the Golgi apparatus maintains a position that's very close to the endoplasmic reticulum. So the cis face is the side that faces the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the trans face is the side that faces the, uh, faces the cytoplasm and ultimately faces the edge of the cell. So vesicles are going to travel from the endoplasmic reticulum and tr travel through these stacks of membranes. You can see here's one pancake-like stack, here's another, here's another, here's another. 
And then those vesicles are going to emerge from the transphase and go wherever they need to go. And you can see numerous vesicles in this picture, either in the process of being formed like this one. So this is going to pinch off or already fully formed and then leaving the Golgi. So regardless, all of these vesicles are going to go off to various locations, either to the edge of the cell or to another location within the cell. Okay, so cells in the pancreas manufacture large amounts of protein. Doesn't matter what protein, just know that there's a lot of it. So which of the following would you expect to find a large number of in pancreatic cells? Would it be A, lysosomes? Well, we haven't talked about that yet, so probably not. Would it be B, rough endoplasmic reticulum? Oh, it seems like a pretty good guess, but we haven't read the rest of the choices yet, so let's just star it for now. It's always a bad idea to select the first answer in a list that you think is correct and then stop reading after that. That's a really, really bad strategy for multiple choice test taking, so don't do that. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it's still the endoplasmic reticulum, but we haven't talked about what smooth does yet. Chloroplasts? Nope, those are in plant cells. And all cells have a plasma membrane, so that's out too. So now we have a choice between rough and smooth. If we know rough means that there are ribosomes on it, and we know ribosomes are responsible for making protein, then B is the best answer for this. And the answer is indeed B. All right, many antibiotics work by blocking the function of ribosomes. Therefore, these antibiotics will A, block DNA synthesis. Well, that's not what ribosomes do. B, block protein synthesis. That's a candidate. Let's see what else there is. Prevent the movement of proteins through the nuclear pores. Mm, we haven't really talked about any level of that regulation, so that one's probably out. Uh, and make two nuclear membranes fuse into one. This is not something that really ever happens. Nuclear membranes can uh, divide, but they don't tend to fuse. So B is the best answer for this one. Alrighty, so all the other organelles. So we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and this is continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. But it doesn't have the same job. So although the membranes are continuous, this one makes lipids. It provides detoxification via the enzymes that are inside of it and it metabolizes glycogen. So for example, uh, your liver, which is responsible for making bile and detoxifying toxins that enter your body, and also for metabolizing glycogen, your liver has a lot of endoplasmic reticulum in it, cells, specifically smooth ER. So if you were to look at a hepatocyte, a smooth ER cell, you would find way more smooth ER than in another cell. So one way that cells can specialize is by changing the relative amount of organelles that they have to suit whatever their particular job is. Lysosomes are for recycling. So these are small bubbles of membrane. They're essentially vesicles full of hydrolases. And a hydrolase is an enzyme that does one particular reaction, and that is a reaction that you're familiar with, and that is enzymatic hydrolysis. So the lysosome is where stuff gets sent to be dismantled. So if the cell needs to recycle something and take it apart, that's where it goes. So here's an example of that. We've got a lysosome with digestive enzymes. So these are specifically mostly hydrolases. Oops, <laughs> hydrolases, nope, hydrolases. And then we have a worn out organelle. So sometimes an entire organelle just needs to go. It's done doing its job, it's malfunctioning and it has to be destroyed. But consider a mitochondrion. So this thing has useful membranes, so phospholipids. 
It has abundant enzymes, which are made of proteins, so proteins. And it's got some DNA in it too, more on that later, so there are nucleic acids in there as well. All of these are useful building materials for a cell, so you don't really want to just throw them away. That's a waste. Instead, the worn-out organelle fuses with the lysosome, and once that occurs, the hydrolases inside of the lysosome get to work breaking down the worn-out organelle. So once the two fuse, this is actually called an autophagosome. Um, so autophagy is the act of self-eating. So uh, <laughs> uh, auto means self. Sorry, I'm getting poked. That's why I giggled. And phagy means to eat. So autophagy is the process of a cell or an organism eating itself. So that's why it's called an autophagosome. Oh, and so means body. So once the organelle is broken down, any useful molecules are returned to the cytosol for the cell to recycle and make new stuff. And then any waste things that the cell doesn't need or that are toxins or that it doesn't like, these are just excreted from the cell into the environment. So this you could reasonably consider cell poop. Alrighty, so here's a another example of a way that lysosomes can be used. So what we've got here is a macrophage, and this is a kind of white blood cell. And this particular macrophage has encountered a bacterium of some kind. And bacteria, we have them all over the surface of our bodies and inside of our uh, mouth and elementary canal, so our, our food tube, but they're not really supposed to be between our cells or in our blood or swimming around between tissues. So this guy has to go. This is a bad guy. So the macrophage is going to eat up the bacterium, and then once it does that, it has to do something with it. So a vesicle forms that contains the offending bacterium, and then the lysosome comes and fuses with that in the same way it would with a worn-out organelle. So we don't call this an autophagosome because it's not the cell eating itself, it's the cell destroying another uh, foreign invader. So not. And eventually the bad cell gets degraded into waste. Okay, so one topic we need to address is the endomembrane system. So let's break down this word here. Endo means inside, and membrane means what it sounds like. So the production line in a cell that makes things is the endomembrane system. So what it does is it modifies packages and transports lipids and proteins. So proteins, uh, they are born in here. The instructions are in here and they travel this way until they are either stuck in the membrane like this one is, or they end up outside or somewhere else in the cell. Lipids undergo the same process. So lipids are made in here and they travel through this network to the Golgi and then they are packaged. So maybe phospholipids are made in here because the cell needs to replace some membrane that it has. Uh, they would go via this route and then get incorporated into the membrane. So that's what the endomembrane system is for. All right, mitochondria. So we're going to end pretty soon because this video is already getting pretty long, um, but I do want to finish up with eukaryotic cell stuff first. So mitochondria, as you might know from high school biology, are the powerhouse of the cell. But one thing that high school biology doesn't ever address is what exactly that means, right? So you're told it and then you regard it as useless information for a long time. But the fact of the matter is not only would you not be alive if it weren't for your mitochondria, but also uh, your mitochondria have a really cool origin that's independent from the rest of your organelles. So 
we got to talk about that too. So mitochondria are organelles that extract energy from food and transform that energy into a chemical that the cell can use, and that chemical is called ATP. So I'm going to change colors here really quick. So ATP equals adenosine triphosphate. And you can think of that as being the energy dollar of the cell. So when a cell wants to do anything that costs energy, like copy DNA, make a protein, blah, 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 it has to spend energy, and that energy is spent in the form of ATP. So every time you break an ATP, a little poof of energy is released that can be used to do cellular work. So this is where the ATP comes from. So if your cells didn't have mitochondria, uh, you would not be able to do any cellular work and therefore not live anymore. So these are also the reason that we eat food, because food has covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are rich in energy, so when you break them, energy comes out, and they can be used to make ATP. And the way that we get that energy out of covalent bonds is by oxidizing the food molecules that we eat. So oxygen and food go into a mitochondrion, and then a bunch of stuff happens in here that we'll get to later. For now, let's just call it magic, because it kind of is. And out comes water, carbon dioxide, and ATP. So ATP is the goal, and then water and carbon dioxide are kind of uh, byproducts. So mitochondria are actually the, the reason that we breathe out carbon dioxide as well. So your breath when you exhale is a mixture of water and carbon dioxide, and this is why. Those two things are produced by cells as wastes, they are transferred into the blood, and then you breathe them out. So this is a picture of a real mitochondrion. This is a scanning electron micrograph. So no, they're not really blue. This has been falsely colored so that you can make out details, but you can see uh, very clearly that there's an inner and an outer membrane and that the inner membrane is folded into these complex stacks. So the reason that mitochondria are illustrated like this is because that's how they actually look. It's just a cartoony version of their real appearance. So here's another picture. Um, this is a scanning electron micrograph, and you can see that there's mitochondrial matrix, which is kind of like cell membrane inside of the mitochondrion, and then there is cristae, which are the folds of the inner membrane, and those are all surrounded by the outer membrane. Okay, so the function of the lysosome is Let's go through our choices, shall we? Protein synthesis. No, not really. We know that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is for that. Uh, what about digesting materials inside the cell? Hmm, that sounds kind of like recycling. Let's put a star by that one. Taking in food and producing ATP. No, mitochondria do this. Not lysosomes, so that's out. And this is ribosomes. So nope. Producing ribosomal RNA. Uh, we haven't talked about this at all, so that's not a candidate. And allowing the cell to move certainly isn't true because that was not any of the stated functions of the lysosome. So therefore, B is the only possible choice. So when I do this, I'm giving you examples of ways that you can sort of reason through uh, multiple choice questions, even if you're not 100% certain of the answer. So the, one of the nice things about multiple choice, even though it's reductive, is that um, it is to some extent a gameable system, meaning that you don't actually have to be 100% confident in your answer in order to do well on a multiple choice test, as long as you have your strategy in mind. Okay, so I think we're going to end here on cytoskeleton because I've been talking long enough and also because my dog is staring at me because he needs to go outside. So uh, tomorrow I'll record the rest of this video as well as a tutorial on diffusion, osmosis, and membrane flux, and those will be available to you ASAP. In the meantime, thanks for your attention and have an awesome night.